Well, thanks. Um, the thing that I was asked to talk about here is what will security standardization and certification look like 10 years from now? Um, that's, of course, a key question if you're in the business of selling stuff and planning to sell stuff. And in fact, um, as I'm going to um, describe, there's already some standards which can be applied uh, in a number of interesting ways. Now, the genesis of this talk um, goes to a report that um, two colleagues and I spent the spring writing. Um, Aaron Leverett, Richard Clayton and I did a report for the um, EU Joint Research Centre in Milan, which was commissioned by DG Infosoc. And what the European Commission wanted to know is how they have to change their regulatory regime in anticipation of the problems that the Internet of Things will cause. Now, once there's software everywhere, this is going to impact dozens and dozens of EU institutions, standards bodies, um, and um, relationships which are involved in things like figuring out safety of cars, medical devices, electrotechnical equipment. There's maybe 12 to 15 uh, major verticals, but we looked at these three. And the idea is that by looking at three um, um, industries that we know a bit about, we might be able to abstract general principles that would be applicable more widely. So here's the problem statement. We regulate safety in an awful lot of industries. Um, whether it's an EU competence or a member state competence or joint varies from here to, um, here to there. But the general problem is that once you start putting communications and computers in everything, um, you get new um, security risks around safety. So at the moment, for example, when Mercedes decides, decides to design a new car, they hire some engineers, they spend three years building a prototype, they then show it to European officials, they strap in some crash dummies, they bash it against some walls, they get some people to stare at the software and the various devices in the vehicle. Eventually they get um, ticks of approval and they ramp up production. Three years later it goes on sale and it sells for seven years and then it's a used car. So it's something with a 10-year cycle which depends on pre-market inspection and testing. But within 10 years, um, at the latest, um, the safety of a car is going to be something that depends on the monthly software upgrade. This is already the case with Tesla. Ford is already starting to bring in over-the-air software update. And we are seeing some uh, recalls uh, which involve vehicles and other devices being recalled to the garage for the ROMs to be reflashed, which is more expensive. So like it or not, this is going to change hugely. And so safety and security will come together. Now, if you speak any language other than English, they already do, because such words as sicurezza, seguridad, sûreté, sicherheit, and so on, include both security and safety. And now that everything's coming together, what do we have to do to upgrade regulation to cope? Well, here's the background that markets do safety better in some industries than others. In airlines, in air transport, the incentives are well aligned because the pilot's the first person on the scene of the accident and the airline CEO's stock drops in value if he has a crash. Uh, so does the stock of the CEO of the airplane maker. So people actually make an effort. Uh, but in other fields, they don't make anything like an economic amount of effort. And the famous case is cars, where the first 80 years or so of cars being produced saw the vendors putting on more chromium and not worrying about seat belts. And finally, in the 60s, this became a scandal. Ralph Nader's unsafe at any speed moved the um, issue up the political agenda. In America, you've got the National Highways and Transport Safety Administration. In Europe, we've got the Product Liability Directive. And this really matters because it says that no matter what um, uh, don't sue me buttons you force people to push, people still can sue you if a device that you sell them uh, causes death or injury or damage to the property of a natural person. And what we do in a typical industry, say for example cars, is that we reinforce that general principle uh, with a directive which sets out how that particular product is to be tested, certified and approved. And there's the number for the framework detective and directive and type approval for cars. So this is the overall thing. You've got a few broad directives in general, then some broad directives per industry, and then dozens and dozens, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of specific rules um, affecting a particular industry. 
Now, as far as car makers are concerned, the traditional legacy vendors are moving to autonomy in steps. You start with adaptive cruise control and then automatic emergency braking and automatic lane keeping. And eventually, if you add enough features, you almost get to the point that you can get on the motorway and go to sleep um, and you get to your destination. And then, of course, you've got the, the challengers like Google and Tesla who are moving fast. And Tesla recently shipped uh, autonomy by means of a software update. And uh, Toyota is saying that from 2019, um, all the cars they produce will have the sensors needed for autonomy, so then autonomy will be rolled out in stages again as a software update. Ford, as I mentioned, is already moving to updating. So that's one field's background. Here's another. Here's um, a hospital in Southampton. Embedded systems. Hey, uh, can anybody spot the computer here? You see there's lots of them. You know, if you have a car crash or you come off your motorbike, you can end up depending on 20 or 30 or 50 computers already. And these are extraordinarily dangerous. There's a mate of mine come off his motorbike a bit over a year ago and broke both thighs in his pelvis. And he was in a hospital near Southampton and was almost killed uh, when they were about to give him 150 milligrams of morphine rather than the 30 that he was getting. You know, the normal dose for a non-addict is 15. Right? So it's very, very easy, given the design of many infusion pumps and other medical devices, for users to make fatal accidents. And um, uh, Mark is only around because he noticed this in Hollard. And um, something like 2,000 people a year die of um, accidents involving safety usability in medical equipment. And you can see the sort of reason there. Um, there are the um, infusion pumps in an emergency room in Southampton. And you'll see they've all got different keyboard layouts. So um, it's like the nurse is having to fly a, um, a SOP with Camel one minute and a Boeing 747 the next. Um, and that's known to be a bad thing. You can see even the bodyguard 545. One instance has up being a 2 and down being a 0. And the instance at the bottom has got up being a 5 and down being a 0. So can't we have standards? Yes, we've got standards. We've got a standard that says that litres should be in a capital L, so it's not confused with a 1. And there you see in the bottom right, that standard is complied with in the large green text and is not complied with in the smaller yellow text. So this is the kind of thicket that you see around safety of medical devices. And this is a mess because safety regulation is down to um, individual member states. Uh, and that's going to be fixed. Um, at the moment, we've um, centralized um, safety regulation of pharmaceuticals, currently in London, probably about to move to Sweden after, after Brexit. Uh, medical devices will be next. And for perfectly good reasons, Brussels will be centralizing control over safety regulation. Uh, member states like Britain simply can't be trusted. What goes wrong in Britain is that the non-executive directors of the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority tend to be retired chief scientists from drug companies and medical device makers. Right? On a, a, a bigger political unit, you can deal with that kind of petty corruption. In Britain, we've been chronically unable to. So um, there we have basically what I said there, that present, at present, we've got a broken system where... In a country like Britain, devices are um, approved basically on paperwork alone. The MHRA employs no engineers. The FDA employs only two. And all they can do is look at paperwork, not test devices. That's going to get fixed. And a good job, too. But security is going to make this happen more quickly. Because in America, where the medical device makers have had it their own way since God was a boy, um, yes, uh, last year, there was an upset because uh, some guys at UMass in Amherst managed to show that there was a hacking attack on one of the infusion pumps produced by Hospira. Now, the FDA had been unwilling or unable politically to move on such devices merely being dangerous because of poor security usability. But once it appeared in the press that this thing could be hacked remotely over Wi-Fi, uh, they felt compelled to move. And so as security becomes entangled with safety, a whole lot of safety problems that people were able to ignore for years or decades suddenly become incapable of being ignored because journalists are really, really interested in things that go wrong because of hostile action. And, of course, there are many, many things to worry about. How do you do upgrades? 
Well, upgrades break certification, don't they? The first DDoS attack we had was in 1998 uh, against Panics in New York. And um, that was a, a left-wing ISP which was attacked by, attacked by right-wing activists. And they basically used for their attack a bunch of medical devices in hospitals in Oregon, which were required uh, to run um, a, a known vulnerable version of Berkeley Unix as a condition of device certification. So we've known for almost 20 years as a practical matter that there's a serious tension between the needs to upgrade stuff for security um, and um, the mechanics of safety certification. So this isn't a new problem, it's an old problem, but now it's one that's moving up front and center. What about the third sector we looked at? Well, in energy, um, ENISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency, um, reports that the energy sector's got the highest rate of reported vulnerabilities and attacks in the whole of the critical national infrastructure. And there's a whole story here um, around um, smart meters. You can pick up various papers in this on my website. Um, GCHQ, which is doing the security on smart meters, is basically worried only about the nation state scale threats that would interfere with its operations. They're worried that somebody might be able to switch 20 million meters off and on and thereby bring down the grid and interrupt the supply of electricity to Cheltenham. But they don't have the correct incentive to worry about whether I could rip off the power company or much more to my concern as a, um, a bill payer, whether the power company could rip me off. So there are institutional failures here and we don't have any player in the game whose job it is to help the consumer to see to it that I'm not going to get ripped off by stuff that's deployed. So here's the big picture. In Europe, we've got a multi-stakeholder approach with big principles, broad principles of liability, transparency, and privacy, and specific industry requirements and testing and certification. And this system's about to get a really big shock because we're moving from a 10-year cycle to a one-month cycle, and institutions are going to need cybersecurity expertise so that they can figure out what are sensible things to require, and so that they've got people who can make some coherent input into the policy process. Otherwise, that will be captured by all sorts of special, inf special interests. So here's the challenge. Uh, moving from pre-market testing on a 10-year cycle to a world in which, if you've got a, an exploit, adversaries can scale that into a major scale attack um, within months, weeks, even days. Look at the, um, the variants of the Mirai botnet that are now going around. We're getting something like 10 variants a day. And if you can't patch stuff, you're in serious trouble. So you go to a time constant of one month. And how are all these torpid government agencies, which look at videos of crash tests and um, accelerometer readings from crash test dummies and so on, going to cope with a world uh, in which a safety case is something that has to be maintained dynamically. So here are the sort of questions we have to ask. How will incentive structures evolve? Um, regulation is difficult, regulations get captured, people argue about it all the time, businesses complain about red tape. Hey, um, there's no easy solution to this. If anybody had found one, we'd know it already. So how do we add post-market surveillance to pre-market testing? in a way that doesn't entirely gum up the works. Who's going to investigate incidents and to whom will they be reported? At present, the NIS directive says that um, breaches and uh, vulnerabilities should be reported to your local three or four letter agency who may then think about whether the public should be um, involved. In America, they have better laws. You've got security breach reporting laws in almost all states which say that affected individuals should be told directly. We also have got um, norms of um, responsible vulnerability disclosure, which we know work within our own industry. So how is that all going to evolve? And how are we going to bring safety and security engineers together? Because we go to almost entirely different conferences, we read different books, we use different language, um, we've got different ideas um, of what decent testing amounts to. And where does the expertise come from? At present, the, the European Union has got an ESA. Now, that was deliberately put in Heraclean by the British and French, who didn't want to have serious competition to um, the national security agencies. 
and they can't keep technical staff. Right? Um, they go and hire engineers, and the engineers go there, and they find that the lawyer sitting next to them is earning twice as much money, and they say, um, enough of this, and they go and get a, a job with Siemens. Um, how can you get an agency that is on hand in Brussels, which can provide advice as needed to policymakers, and which can retain people who have got um, not just an engineering degree, but enough experience and enough now to have some clue about what's actually going on and can give good advice into the policy process. All sorts of stresses and strains are becoming apparent. You may have heard of the uh, Birmingham case where researchers at Birmingham and Nijmegen found um, a bug with Volkswagen's remote key entry system. Um, and so they did responsible disclosure. They told the um, companies that they were going to be disclosing this in about a year at Usenix Security. So Volkswagen did nothing until the last minute and then sued Birmingham and got an injunction, which later failed. The court took it away a couple of years later and the information was um, disclosed and the world didn't end as Volkswagen said it would. Um, as a matter of fact, the car thieves already knew all this stuff and Birmingham had got their knowledge of the algorithm by reverse engineering car theft tools that they got from a website in Romania. Now, in the IT industry, we know how to cope with this. You've got vulnerability breach disclosure, you've got institutional support such as CERTs, and we even have international standards around this. ISO 30111, for example, um, talks about managing your vulnerability lifecycle. And Volkswagen were very naughty indeed for not complying with uh, an applicable international standard. Because after all, if you stamp CE on goods that you're selling within the European Union, you're claiming as the manufacturer and vendor that you comply with all available standards. So if anybody thinks that they can get away um, with not figuring out how to patch their stuff, that's not in fact the case. Right? If the customs men at Rotterdam had been knowing what they were doing, then when all these containers arrived with video cameras from Xiaomai that were then used in the Dyn DNS attack, the customs man could have said, we'd like to see your 30111 compliance documentation, please, sir. None of that. Oh, sorry, this container has to go back to Shanghai. Put it back on the ship. You can't, put this in, you can't unload this uh, crap in Europe. That's what they could have done under existing regulations. CE, compliance with relevant standards. Okay. So to whom should we report bugs in cars and not get sued? Well, one thing that um, interests academics like us is that when a, a new um, industry change comes along, where will the interesting research questions be? And there will be dozens. Let me give you an example. Long-term maintenance. There's all sorts of embedded systems out there that have been going for a long time. My first proper job was designing inertial navigation sets back in the mid-70s. And I'm sure some of the kit that we work with is still flying around in tornadoes and planes like that. Um, how on earth could anybody maintain that now? Quite possibly they don't bother trying uh, because those particular boxes aren't network connected. But let me pose a question. Suppose that you have people working in a startup in Cambridge now who are writing navigation software that's going to go in Land Rovers that are sold in 2019. Then who's going to be doing the maintenance, the security patching of that software in 2039 when these 20-year-old Land Rovers with 200,000 miles on the clock are happily bumping around the felt in Kenya, um, taking tourists out to look at whatever game there is left? How do you go about planning now for your software to be maintainable in 20 years' time? Do you say, right, we'll grab a version of today's Linux, and we'll put it on a PC, and we'll put the PC in a Tempest vault, and we'll put the entire tool chain on it, and we'll hope for the best? Or do you say, we will get a PC, and we will backport all the security patches from future versions of Linux so that we've got a platform on which our tools will still work that we need to compile this stuff so that it will still work in 2039? Or do you say, well, what we'll do is tweak the compiler so that it creates lots of patches of knobs in it where we can hand punch uh, some opcodes in order to patch out stuff that turns out to be terrible later? Do you say, well, we'll pay some uh, research students to go and think deeply about compiler architectures and whether you can perhaps use intermediate representations and blah, 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 blah. Well, the answer is all of the above, 
quite probably, and nobody's really thinking about this stuff yet. There are also serious economic questions, because at the moment, Google can't get Samsung to patch Android in phones that they sold two years ago. Why? Because all the guys in Samsung who go and mess up Android and introduce all sorts of bugs in it, see our papers on factory reset, for an example, um, they've only got enough people to mess up the current version of Android that they're currently selling. They don't have enough programmers to keep on um, backporting patches to versions of Android that they messed up three years ago. So there are staffing resource implications as well. And if you think mobile phones are bad, think about cars. We're heading towards a world in, in which, unlike your mobile phone that might only have 20 or 30 CPUs in it, your car will have hundreds. Right? right wing mirror, that will have a CPU. Left wing mirror, that will have a CPU. Mirror here, CPU. Everything will have a CPU. Each tar will have a CPU. How on earth do you economically do tar pressure sensors? Right? It's easier just to drop in another ARM core than it is to sit down and start designing logic. Now, how much of this stuff is just drop and forget? Right? How much of this stuff um, do you never have to patch because it's simply not accessible over the CAN bus and there's no way in which anybody could possibly do a buffer overflow on it? Do you have anybody who knows how to write such code? Hey, things to think about. And then what our customers were interested in in this um, thing was what happens to the regulators. And as you can see from this slide, there is a very large number of institutional players, many of them in Europe, many of them in the member states, some of them in the private sector. Um, many of those in the private sector get much of their work from government. Others, such as insurance industry associations, don't get their work from government directly, but from regulated bodies. And then, of course, you've got standards bodies entirely outside the Euro European ecosystem like NIST doing useful work. How does this all come together? So detailed recommendations. Firstly, uh, the EU should update the product liability directive to cope with systems that involve multiple products and services. Second, it should require vendors to self-certify for their CE mark that their products are secure by default and can be updated if need be. That's implicit in 3 or triple one. It should be made explicit so that there's no room for doubt. Third, we need to update the Network and Information Society Directive so that breaches and vulnerabilities are reported to safety regulators and users, not just to three and four letter agencies. Fourth, there needs to be some work on moving safety standards bodies towards assessing security and safety together, which involves a whole lot of detail um, but at the very least, safety regulators should require a secure development life cycle with documented vulnerability management following ISO 29174 and 30111 at a minimum. Harder is the fact that we're going to have to move from certifying products to assurance of whole systems, including the patch cycle. Because if your car is not just a car, uh, but a platform with four wheels running some apps, um, all of which communicate with back-end services, um, then that has good implications for liability. At present, the Product Liability Directive covers only products, not services. So if your Garmin gets you into trouble, if you drive down a lane in Cornwall and get your caravan stuck in a little lane and have to pay a thousand pounds to have a caravan to pull it out, you can sue Mr. Garmin, regardless of how many times he made you click on that annoying little don't sue me button. But if Google Maps ends you up in the same state, then you cannot sue Mr. Google Maps because he's a service. And stuff like that has got to be fixed, otherwise you know, everything will become a service, there will be no liability, and stuff will become hazardous and toxic. This is going to be a hard one for the regulators. Oh, and if they're going to deal with hard problems, they're going to have to get some expertise. So we suggest what we need is a European security engineering agency that is an agency that hires cryptographers and security engineers and is explicitly focused on personal safety, on consumer protection, and on supporting authorities and things like uh, competition policy, rather than any of this, oh my God, it's national security, it's terrorism, right? Which just uh, completely gets everybody onto the wrong page and, div and um, diverts the resources down inappropriate rat holes. So where should this lead? Well, the vision that we have been selling to Europe um, is, is this. At present, if you're an engineer working in the valley, 
you see Europe as the world's privacy regulator. That's why Facebook does its security engineering in London and why Google does its privacy engineering in Munich, right? Because if you can make stuff work in the EU, you can make it work anywhere, right? Washington doesn't care about privacy and nobody else is big enough to matter, right? If the government of Kazakhstan suddenly becomes fanatical about privacy, you just ignore them. You don't return their phone calls. That's how people operate in the valley. But you can't not return phone calls from the European Union. It's too big. So what we've been saying is that European institutions should aim to be the world's safety regulator too, right? Because if it's going to be done anywhere, it's going to be done here. And to do that, we need to adapt our structures to cope with safety and security together. And we have to start thinking really hard about how you do monthly updates and how you keep on doing monthly updates for the next 10 or 20 or even 50 years, depending on the kind of product you're selling. And as they said, uh, we've got a book on this stuff. We've actually been doing embedded systems since the 1970s. And then there were things that think, and now they're Internet of Things. Many of the principles go across, but there's going to be a, a really serious change to the system in terms of what's needed from regulators and what's expected from industrialists and service providers. Thanks.